Remember when Matt Slick said this? Now, as far as dating okay. methods go, that's really important because, here we go, there are different rock layer dating methods, rock layer positioning, like Pleistocene rock layer, which according to just uh, strat stratigraphic analysis should be 1.6 million years old, years of age. But with the rubidium strontium method, it's 773 million years old. And I've got a whole bunch of, of these kinds of things where the differences are 500 million years old, uh, 20 million years old, a billion uh, years of di difference uh, meant, between different dating methods. Now, I wanted to read the original source material and, and find out what uh, what Slick was referring to. And, of course, you have to go to the uh, the Answers in Genesis article that he's referring to and see if you can figure out from that what what that article is referring to because i don't like to give original sources and the reason is obvious because when they do and you you see what it actually says well then it doesn't say what they say it should uh however the original article that when i found what it was uh the citation that was in that was buried in another article written by somebody working for aig uh i realized that the original article is behind a paywall now as it happens, I know a paleoclimatologist, uh, Jonathan Baker, who actually does radiometric dating. So I reached out to him and asked him, you know, how he would address this. And I was hoping to have a discussion about that, but we couldn't get that scheduled. So uh, he sent me this video response and take a listen. You may have caught this video the other day where Matt Slick was fielding calls from his viewers and he began to rattle off a series of memes that he thought supported his young earth creationist stance. One in particular, though, caught my attention, where he made the claim that uh, some rocks that were supposed to be 1.6 million years old actually gave rubidium strontium ages of 773 million years. Now, if that's correct, this is a pretty huge discrepancy, orders of magnitude difference. So I wanted to dig into the primary literature, share some of that with you, and examine where this discordance comes from and uh, whether or not it actually supports his claim that we have warrant to be skeptical of radiometric dating in general. So, I hope you enjoy. A popular creationist claim is that rocks yield wildly different ages depending on the dating method used. If that's true, and especially if it's commonplace, we could reasonably be skeptical of the results of radiometric dating. Now, to be fair, we do find the occasional discrepancy, but I want to focus on the specific cases raised by Matt Slick here, who alleges up to a billion year difference between rubidium strontium and other methods in volcanic rocks of western Uganda. To do so, let's briefly review the rubidium strontium system. 87 rubidium is the radioactive parent which yields 87 strontium, the radiogenic daughter, by beta decay. And the half-life of this reaction is about 49 billion years. So for any given mineral, the ratio of radiogenic 87 strontium to the stable isotope 86 strontium will increase exponentially with time. Because of the incredibly long half-life, however, this curve will appear to be flat on most time scales of Earth history. Rubidium strontium dating is performed using the isochron method, which is valid when a well-mixed magma with a given 87-86 strontium ratio solidifies into minerals that have a wide range of rubidium concentrations. Because rubidium replaces potassium in the crystal lattice, it is higher in minerals that naturally contain a lot of potassium, like alkali feldspars, and lower in minerals that don't. However, the 87-86 strontium ratio will be the same in all the minerals at time equals zero. As radioactive decay proceeds, 87 rubidium is lost and 87 strontium is gained, causing each of these points to follow a linear path up and to the left. This behavior increases the slope on a graph of 87 strontium versus 87 rubidium when normalized to the stable isotope of strontium. Therefore, the slope corresponds to the time elapsed since this suite of minerals last cooled below 650 degrees Celsius, known as the closure temperature. The advantage of this isochron method is that we don't need to assume the initial concentration of daughter product. Sounds good, right? One complication is that the mixing of two magmas can mimic an isochron plot. For example, magma 1 has a low 87-86 ratio of both strontium and rubidium, whereas magma 2 has a high 87-86 ratio. If these magmas are mixed in variable proportions, the resulting minerals should plot along a line that connects the end member ratios. This is called a mixing line. However, the slope of this line does not correspond to the age of the minerals. Rather, it tells us approximately how long ago the two magmas separated from a common source. Well, let's take a look now at Matt's claim. There are different rock layer dating methods, rock layer positioning, like the Pleistocene rock layer, which, according to just stratigraphic analysis, should be 1.6 million years of age, 
but with the rubidium strontium method, it's 773 million years. What he means here is that we have recent volcanics from the Cenozoic, which give a rubidium strontium isochron age of 773 million years. That's an error of at least 700 million years, so what's the deal? The claim itself is taken from a blog article by Paul Guillaume, who, who does add some clarification. In this article, he cites the classic geochemistry text by Gunther Farah, who devotes a full chapter to explaining what happens to isotope ratios when you mix things like magma. Part of that discussion centers around false rubidium strontium isochrons that result from mixing lines. But Paul is not convinced by Farah's assessment and thinks they are confidently written off as mixing lines without evidence. So we should rather interpret them as true rubidium strontium dates that just happen to be really, really wrong. So how can we resolve this? Well, first, let's do something that Mr. Slick, I'm sure, has never done and look at the primary data from Bell and Powell, 1969. What do you see? At first glance, this does look similar to the hypothetical isochrons I showed earlier, right? There is covariance to the data, and if you estimate a regression line, like Gunter Farah did for his textbook, the slope corresponds to a rubidium strontium age of approximately 773 million years. But this is not an isochron, it's a mixing line. So the age has more to do with the magma sources rather than when the minerals formed, which was the conclusion both of Farah and the original authors. Still, it's reasonable to ask, how do you tell the difference? First, magmas don't mix like the ingredients of your last martini. They are subject to a few stochastic processes, and mixing occurs sporadically over long periods of time, so the minerals don't all form at once. Whereas isochrons make straight lines, mixing lines produce what are called scattercrons. They are linear-ish, but not lines. Second, mixing lines produce covariance only when we plot the 87-86 ratios of strontium and rubidium. But if you plot 87-86 strontium against total strontium, the shape is hyperbolic. In this case, magma-1 has a lot more strontium, so adding just a little bit of it to the mix has a big impact on the 87-86 ratio. If the 87-86 ratios were produced by radioactive decay, however, this plot should yield a straight line, similar to our rubidium strontium isochron, but with a negative slope. That's one way to distinguish a false isochron related to magma age from a true isochron related to mineral age. So what did Bell and Powell find in their data? Oh, look, it's a hyperbola. So when Paul Guillaume said they wrote it off as a mixing line without evidence, what he meant was I chose to ignore their evidence. By the way, you can repeat this exercise with the other elements. Here's 87.86 versus niobium and versus zirconium. Yep, looks like mixing to me. Bell and Powell also noted that hypotheses involving simple fractional crystallization are inconsistent with the isotopic data, which was another way of supporting their interpretation of a mixing line, but this requires more explanation. Let's start with a hypothetical magma with given concentrations of strontium and rubidium. As this magma cools, it will begin to solidify. However, because strontium can replace for calcium in high temperature minerals, it is readily crystallized. Rubidium, on the other hand, replaces potassium in low temperature minerals, so it prefers to stay in the melt. When calcium-rich minerals solidify from the melt, strontium is removed, while rubidium becomes more concentrated. As this process of fractional crystallization continues, the melt progressively becomes rubidium-rich and strontium poor. The result is a curved relationship between strontium and rubidium concentration, which apparently the authors did not find in their data. Now, we can acknowledge that there are plenty of examples where radiometric dating didn't work, meaning there was a discrepancy in ages from one method to another. This is to be expected because radiometric dating is a model of ideal conditions and nature is messy, so we should expect it to not to work sometimes. That being said, most discrepancies are resolved by using updated methods that reduce the number of model assumptions, such as the argon-argon step heating isochron method as opposed to conventional potassium-argon dating. They're also resolved commonly by the giant leap forward in technology since 70 years ago. What makes the claims from Matt and Paul so dubious, however, is that they're based on half-truths. In all cases where the rubidium strontium age allegedly differs by hundreds of millions of years, I found that the original authors didn't even use rubidium strontium dating on their samples. Instead, they were investigating different research questions entirely, such as the magmatic origins of specific types of volcanic rocks. And part of that investigation was to determine the 87-86 strontium ratios to identify the magma sources, not to date the rocks. So to say that the rubidium strontium age differed from the known age of the rocks is a flat-out lie, as we've seen, those ages were estimated from mixing lines that were unrelated to the age of the minerals. To use the rubidium strontium isochron properly, we would analyze a suite of minerals in the same rock that formed from the same magma around the same time and all had the same 87-86 strontium ratio. But the samples reported by Bell and Powell were not from the same rock or the same magma. They were from tens of kilometers apart and formed during different eruptions, each separated by millions of years. 
In reality, rubidium strontium isochron dating remains a robust technique that consistently yields similar ages to other methods, especially when we examine the oldest materials of our planet and solar system. So be cautious when you read claims about false isochron results, and don't be duped like Matt.